Ever wondered why we haven't got a car industry anymore? What happened to all those illustrious names? Then all we need to do is to consider the Hillman Imp, the perfect exemplar. The wrong car, built at the wrong time, for the wrong people in the wrong place. A story of missed turns, mad moves, and a startling inability ever to pass go. You see, the Imp could have been able to challenge the Mini, but instead it was an automotive muck-up of Krakatoan proportions. Why was the Imp rushed to the showrooms half-finished? Why did a shopping car need a high-tech aluminium engine? And why was that engine in the back when everybody else was putting theirs in the front? Such rash modernity was surprising, coming from men like the Roots Brothers. As conservative as the House of Lords, they'd built an empire from churning out bourgeois family saloons, compared to which their new prodigy was positively impish. Roots have been doing very well, thank you very much, selling elegant, ritzy cars to Middle England. And they should have known that if they took on an all-new design, in an all-new factory with an all-new workforce, things were bound to go horribly wrong. But then this was the 60s, when presidents preached peace. Royalty wanted to marry commoners, and ordinary people had discovered cars, like the Mini, whose wheeled wizardry had convinced two young, bright roots designers that their plans to come up with a small car of their own were spot on. Well, Mike Parks and I were very good friends. So we went to the director of engineering, B.B. Winter, and said to him, we could design you just the car we want. And he said, all right, get on with it then. The car became known as the Slug, presumably from its appearance, but it didn't get a proper code name till much later on. With the high cost of constant velocity universal joints, front wheel drive was out of the question, uh, and that actually having a rear engine was the most economical layout at the time. The Mini, uh, had set a new niche in the market. Uh, and it was the same niche that, that we were trying to fill. I've worked at Rover for 33 years. I own a classic Rover, and part of my job is to promote the world's greatest small car, the Mini. But I've got a confession to make. I'm an imp fanatic. It had excellent ride quality, it had very good handling quality and very good throttle response. And it drove like a big car, not like a baby car. You, you had a comfortable ride in it. I'm an engineer, it's an engineer's car, it needs an engineer to look after it more. It's a very light engine and, and gearbox, all aluminium, which was very uh, modern in 1963 and it's, it's still the sort of production technique of today. The first of a litany of disasters began when Roots were refused planning permission to build a factory in Coventry. So instead they built it in Glasgow, helped by government grants to bring employment to the beleaguered north. Prime Minister Harold Macmillan wanted to keep everybody busy, which is why there were not one, but two steel mills in Ravenscraig. It would make perfect sense, so the government argued, to have a car factory just across the road. Never mind that it was hundreds of miles away from Roots' nerve centre in Coventry. 22 million pounds later, the computerised Linwood factory was finished. The second mistake was booking Prince Philip to open the factory on May the 3rd, 1963. The government's newest industrial showpiece would open its doors on time, even though the imp's development was a year behind schedule. A programme of panic test driving began. Anybody who could hold a steering wheel was roped in. No experience necessary. You can imagine what it was like with a group of um, people aged 18, 21, something like that, being given prototype cars and asked to drive them um, together, but not do anything silly, and just to put miles on them to see what would happen to the cars. Were they going to be reliable? Was anything going to drop off? Um, what were going to be some of the difficulties of the owner-driver? We tended to drive as you might expect a group of uh, people of that age group to drive. We very much enjoyed it, and we tended to drive very often as a group. And so sometimes you would find that the six or eight cars would be going along together, as if tied together with a piece of string. 
And when we did this after dark, uh, the front chap would have his headlamps on and the chap at the back would have his lights on and the blokes in the middle didn't. But we could see what was happening from the people in front of us. There was one particular chap who first of all managed to run into a steamroller, which we thought was pretty good because they're you know, very fast moving objects. And the second thing he hit was a truck full of railway sleepers. After that, he was taken off the, the driving. In the rush for the royal deadline, nobody noticed that the imp's side lights were illegally low. There wasn't time to change them, so Roots hiked up the front suspension, leaving their new baby bow-legged. HRH arrived, had a slap-up lunch and went away again. But what he didn't know was that the factory was half-built and the silver imp he used to drive himself back to the airport was only one of a tiny handful of finished cars. We had about 20 cars and each trailer load took about seven. And so the cars were run through one door onto a trailer and the trailer subsequently was driven out of the factory. A continuous stream of Hillman imps left the factory on these trailers, but in fact, there were 20 odd cars and three trailers. At 508 pounds, the imp was 60 quid more than the Mini. It might have looked more daring and modern, but it was a shopping car with an engine where the groceries should go. We had a lot of luggage capacity in the front, uh, but people expect to put luggage in the back of a car. We came up with the idea of having the rear window opening so you could put luggage in through, through there. And I suppose it was the start of a hatchback, really. My feelings about the imp now are very much like my feelings toward my children. They've grown up with you. Uh, but after a point, it's up to them as to how they develop. Development was left to owners. Billy was um, dark red, dark red colour, and it. Um, I had an uncle, Billy, and he was quite uh, um, a difficult chap sometimes, and Billy was too, because he didn't always start. Ethel was. Uh, I don't know how she got that name, but Olive's called Olive because, of course, she's Olive Green. And my grandma was called Olive. She's special, she's special to me. I've had her a long time now and uh, she's just so cute. But all the devotion in the world couldn't hide the imp's less than perfect quality control. A string of industrial disputes didn't help either. And the bill quality was dire. An early production imp was taken down to Coventry for inspection and the panel gaps were so huge it could have driven a Dennis bus through them. As for the logistics, they were completely and utterly barking. The aluminium engine block was cast in Scotland, then shipped 500 miles to the Midlands to have the head, crank, pistons and sump bolted on. It was then shipped 500 miles back to Scotland to be fitted in the car by a Bolshie Glaswegian workforce who made Karl Marx seem like a moderate. I wouldn't say bolshie. Uh, I think that's the wrong word altogether. Uh, an element of um, disagreement with the pay systems at Linwood compared with Coventry, the workers there felt that they should be paid exactly the same. Um, even when it was explained that when they reached output figures, they would be paid the same. I have here the actual logbook from the car assembly block, and it makes very interesting reading. Here's a typical day. 8.45, union meeting. 9.30, forklift truck damages bodies. 10.30, fuses blow. 11.15, union meeting. 12 o'clock, complete plant shutdown. There are all sorts of stories, like a guy in the casting department having a double life making golf clubs and the personnel manager leaving in a fit of rage and burning all the personnel records.